Pray with me, please. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for teaching us to pray. My Father, we praise you and honor you. And we thank you that your ears are attentive to our prayers. Be with us now and open those ears and open our hearts, my Father, that you may be glorified in your children and that we may be assured in you that you always listen and hear our prayers. Be with us, Father God. Inspire my message and inspire the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. I invite you, please, to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 18. Chapter 18. We are crawling little by little into 19, where Jesus actually will cross the Jordan and enter Judea. Seems like we've been waiting for that day for a long time. So I just uh, remind you one more time, in chapter 18, uh, there are uh, Bibles in front of your pews. There are also the inserts that we put in, in the bulletin with the readings so that you can follow what it is the Lord is teaching us today. And also in your bulletins, there is a sheet where you can take notes uh, and there are pencils in front of your pews so that if the Lord is speaking to you in anything, you may want to uh, jot it down. So, uh, as I said um, in, my, in my first uh, comments, uh, Jesus is not yet at Jericho. He's still on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And as we know, he's traveling toward Jerusalem and he's traveling to the cross. And in this passage, which is kind of a follow-up of, uh, of last Sunday's uh, sermon and last Sunday's gospel reading, Jesus is still talking to his disciples. He's still talking to them, and he's also talking to the multitude, but I think he's addressing most likely his disciples directly. This parable is a little different, and we're dealing with a very simple parable. I, I think you can read it and, and understand it, but I just want to accent several things for your benefit. But it, this parable is a little different than most other parables that, that we hear Jesus teaching us. And the reason that this parable is a little different is that he tells us from the very beginning what the parable is about. He tells us why he's saying this parable. Um, some parables that we read, we kind of have to wrestle with it and try and figure out who the characters are and, and what the characters are doing and, and, and ultimately be able to determine what is it that Jesus is teaching us. This parable begins with these words. He says, then he spoke a parable to them that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's what this parable is about. That we, the disciples and followers of Jesus, ought always to pray. Always to pray. Not occasionally, not only when we have a need, not when we remember, but that we always ought to be in prayer. Always, every day, we need to be in prayer. Prayer is one of those essential things in the Christian walk. It's, it should be as common to us and as needed for us as eating, as breathing, as putting on dress, 
as doing anything that we do on a normal basis, prayer should be just as common, just as important, just as powerful as anything we do that we really care about. So he tells the parable so that disciples learn, and we learn today, that we are always to pray and never lose heart. The Greek word for lose heart, actually, it means never to faint. Never to faint, never to lose heart. This parable, and I think this is something that is important for you, this parable that Jesus is te teaching us, this message that Jesus is teaching us, is about what Jesus' disciples, not just the twelve, but any follower of Jesus, this is what we ought to occupy our time between the cross and the second coming of Christ. You hear me? This is how we ought to occupy our time between the cross. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He's going to die. Jesus is coming back. In between the cross and the second coming, it is expected that his disciples, his followers, will occupy themselves in prayer. Prayer without ceasing, prayer without fainting, prayer without losing heart. But um, the, the parable is about what we ought to occupy ourselves between the cross and, and the second coming of Christ. And, and the reason I say that is that when you look at the parable, when you look at the parable, the parable ends with these words. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is how the parable ends. With a mention of Jesus' second coming. So it's about Jesus dying on the cross and what Jesus will find once he returns. What are we to occupy ourselves on? Prayer. Prayer is needed. We need it. The world needs it. Everyone needs our prayers. And we ought to, as disciples of Jesus, find ourselves involved in constant communication with God. Prayer is not a waste of time. Prayer is not something that we do only when we have a need. Prayer is something that should be an everyday occurrence, an everyday dependence on us and God. He wants to talk to us, and we need to talk to Him. We need to talk to Him. He wants to talk to us. And so prayer becomes as essential as our breath, as essential as us living. So the parable is about prayer. Now, the key to the parable, because it's not a very hard parable, the key to the parable is that if the judge is the epitome of power and self-righteousness, the widow is the epitome of weakness and defenselessness. It's, it's almost a New Testament, a New Testament David and Goliath story. A New Testament David and Goliath story. A judge all-powerful, almighty, and a widow who needs help. The weak, 
going to the strong. The contrast in the parable, which I think it's important for us to look at, the contrast in the parable, it's not between the judge and the widow. The contrast in the story is between the judge and God. That's where our focus needs to be. When you pay attention to the, to the passage and to the parable, and we learn a little bit about the judge, the judge clearly was an unbeliever. He, he may have been Jewish, he may not be, but he clearly has no God. He's an unbeliever. He has no respect for God and no fear of God. And the parable tells us, this man, he could care less about what God has to say or what is written in the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. He could care less. He doesn't care what God has said, what God has commanded, what God wishes for us to do. He has his own laws. He has laws that he himself writes. He doesn't care what God has to say. He determines what justice is, and he determines to whom he's going to give justice and what kind of justice he's going to give. This man doesn't seem to have anyone over him telling him what to do. And he will not accept anyone telling him what to do. This judge is in control of this town. This judge is a little God. He has set himself as God in his own mind, in his own heart, and in this town. He gives justice as he pleases. He gives justice in whatever way he wants and to whom he pleases. His type of justice really is no justice at all. Because he would treat one person differently than he would treat another. Or what the Bible says, with partiality. If he likes you, you're great. You'll do great in his court. If he doesn't like you for whatever reason, you will not do well in his court. No matter what the issue is, he decides what justice is, and that's no justice at all. Certainly not a court of law that you can trust. He's an egotist. He's self-righteous. He's selfish. And he thinks of himself as omnipotent. There's nobody besides him. Not only does he feel that way about God and God's rules and God's ways and God's righteousness and what is right and what is wrong, he also doesn't care about any human being. He fears no man. See, when you fear someone, you kind of listen to that someone. And you're careful in, uh, with how you deal with that person. This man feels that he doesn't care. There is not one human being that can do anything to him. He controls everything. He says, I mean, the parable is very clear about this man. Everything that is ugly about selfishness, everything that is ugly about evil, everything that is ugly about a human being treating another human being, this man possesses it. He just treats people as he wants, and I can only imagine what is it like at home. If this is how he deals with the people, if this is how he deals with justice, what is it like with his children? How would you like to be this man's child or this man's wife? Just because he provides probably amply for the family, he probably treats them all like dirt. Because that seems to be his pattern. He could care less about God, and he could care less about any 
human being. He's a terrifying little God. A terrifying little God. The contrast is with God. Because if this man is like this, God is everything that this man is not. God is the very opposite of all these character or characteristics of this man. That's the contrast in the parable. The contrast is God because God is perfect in justice. God is infinite in love. God eternally cares for his elect and for those who cry out to him. And God has no partiality. In him there's no discrimination. In him there's no divisiveness. God is one way and all know exactly where God is and what God requires. And when we go before the Lord, even if we have sinned terribly, we know that God can be merciful. This judge can be unmerciful. Because he doesn't care about anybody's well-being except his own. God is totally the opposite. God stands in complete opposition to injustice and in attentiveness to the need of others. Our needs and prayers are a priority to God. God is the ultimate and righteous judge. On the other side, we have a widow. See, the widow is not a contrast with the judge. The, the widow is really an example of us, in a way. She, she's kind of an example of us. This widow has societally a number of strikes against her. Number one, she doesn't seem to have much support even within her town. She seems to be kind of just a widow among them. There's no one standing beside her that we know about. There's no one that seems to be supportive of her. There's not anyone who's standing for this widow, so she, her only recourse for whatever's happened to her is this judge. Is this judge. This widow is the epitome of someone who feels alone, alone against the world, alone against someone, alone against situations that are difficult. She's alone. Not only is she a widow, she has no husband, she doesn't seem to even have an adult child that would stand with her and support her against whoever this other adversary is. Someone has done wrong to this widow. I don't know what they've done. The parable doesn't tell us. But someone has done something to her. I don't know if somebody has stolen from her money. I don't know if she's being kicked out of her house. I don't know what has gone wrong in her life that brings her to this man's court. But she has an opposer. She has an adversary. She has someone in her life who's causing her a lot of trouble and a lot of pain. And she doesn't seem to have an adult son that would step up and defend her. She certainly doesn't have a husband. She's a widow. There's no defender. There's no human being that dares to stand against that opposer to defend this woman. Her only recourse is this judge. She is physically unable to defend herself. She's physically unable to deal with this adversary, and she certainly seems poor enough that she can't bribe this judge. See, this type of judge, if you have a lot of money, you can bribe justice. 
This type of judge, this type of man, you can buy justice. Even though he doesn't care about God, doesn't care about man, give him a few thousand dollars and justice goes your way. This woman doesn't seem to even have the ability to offer a bribe. The only thing this woman has is a sense of truth, a sense of faith, in an uncunning ability to be on his face every day, every moment. She is relentless. If she has no one to defend her, she will defend herself. And she goes to the judge and she presents his case and he says, go away. And she comes back the next day at the same time, at the same hour, in the same way, with the same case. And he says, go away. And she comes back the next day at the same hour, in the same way, with the same case. And she does this relentlessly to the point that the judge says, though I fear not God, and I could care less about man, this woman is going to exhaust the hell out of me. I think the best way of dealing with this woman is just dealing with her, doing the justice, and then she'll go away. Then I won't see her the next day with the same case, with the same way, at the same time. Because this woman ain't going to stop. And one of the teachings we need to, to receive from here is that our prayers need to be the same way. Our prayer life ought to be such that we come before the Lord every day in the same way, at the same time, with the same case. Every single day. One of the things I would want you to learn and me to learn is that we don't stop praying unless we get from God what we want or we clearly get a no. Amen. If you don't get a no, you keep coming before the Lord your God every day, every way, at the same time with the same prayer. You never give up on your prayer. You never give up on your, the blessing that it is to come before God with whatever it is going on in your life. Every day, every day, morning, noon, and night, you keep praying for what is important to you. You give thanks to God, you praise God, you worship God, and you offer your petitions before the Lord every day, because here's a, a, something that you may not know. God is never bothered by your insistence in prayer. God invites you to share with him your joys, your sorrows, your pains, your doubts, everything that's going on in your life. He knows it in advance, but there's nothing like you climbing into the Father's lap and telling him all your issues. Every day, at the same time, in the same place, with the same prayer. How do you know the answers? No, if the person you're praying for dies. How do you know the answer to your prayers? No, if the problem resolves itself in some other way and your prayer is not needed anymore because God did something different in another way. Because it doesn't always have to be your way. We only pray the way that we know how to pray, but God can choose to do something at a different time in a different way through a different person. It doesn't have to be you. But unless you get a clear sense, either by the Spirit or by the situation changing, 
You have not received a no, therefore you continue to be insistent and persistent because your father wants to hear from you. You will never bother God. He does not slumber and he does not sleep. You pray in the middle of the night, he hears you. You pray in the middle of situations that are hard, he hears you. And Paul tells us in Romans that even when we don't have words to pray, the Holy Spirit in us prays. Romans chapter 8. The Spirit prays when we can't utter anything except sobbing. The Spirit prays, and the Father hears the prayers that are brought to Him. You will never, you will never bother God. He invites your prayers. He invites the cries of His people. He invites the praises of His people, and He receives them. This widow did not tire this widow did not faint. This widow was persistent in asking for justice. And if he hadn't given it to her, she would have been there the next day at the same time, in the same way, with the same petition. You see, what I call SOS prayers, they're wonderful. Sometimes we have SOS prayers, emergency prayers. 911 God. But I think prayer needs to be an everyday communication and relationship with God. Every day, morning to night, we ought to learn what it means to pray without ceasing. Prayer without ceasing doesn't mean that you never stop and you can do no work. But what it does is that you pray for the work that you're going to be doing. What it means is that if you hear an ambulance, you, you pray for who that ambulance is either carrying or going to pick up. That if you hear of someone having a problem, you pray for that problem. That if you see an accident, you pray even though you were not in that accident. Prayer without ceasing is a life filled with prayer. For everything that you see from morning to night, whether it's your problem or somebody else's problem, you hear of something going on, you pray. You hear of a war in Africa, you pray for Africa. You hear of anything, you are constantly bringing to your Father the issues that are important to you and to this world. That's what it means to pray without ceasing. You pray for breakfast, you pray for lunch, and you pray for dinner. You pray for waking up, you pray for having a job, and you pray for, for going to have a, a bed and a restful day. You pray because you are in constant communication, contact, attachment. You grab on to the, to the skirt of God. You grab on to his finger or you grab on to his hand, whichever analogy works for you. You constantly have to be attached to the heart of God. And that happens through prayer. This widow is an example to us of someone who prays or who goes to find justice. And the, the judge gets bothered, but God never gets bothered. He invites that contact. He invites that communication because he cares for his children. You see, this widow may be unknown in the town or uncared for by anybody, but we certainly have a God who knows us and who knows us by name. And we have a God who cares and we have a God who hears and we have a God that stands for us and who's our defender and our buckler and our shield and our helmet, and he's everything that would defend us from our adversaries, especially the adversary. We have a God who fights for his people. He did it for Israel, and he does it for us. 
So we go to that God who never tires, never sleeps, and has a heart for you to do you good. I have a plan for you. I have a plan for your life, and I'm going to exercise that plan. Come to me anytime you're in need. Now, he may not answer the way you want to. He may not answer as quickly as you want to, but God will always hear your prayer, and he will act upon your prayers. So we have here the story of this, this widow. We have the story of this widow. And it basically, as it said from the very beginning, that we always ought to pray and never lose heart. Now, I ask this question from you. How do we lose heart? How do, we, how do you tend to lose heart? Well, sometimes when you're feeling weakness or you're, you feel that you're not in control, you're not listened to, you find yourself in a place of hopelessness, you find yourself in a place where you don't know how to go forward, and you can lose heart. You can lose heart when, when you see no results to your efforts, and you give up. You know, you, you, I, how many times have we heard, I've been praying about this for a long time, and God doesn't give it to me, so I don't pray anymore for it. That's not persistence. That's not insistence. That's not what this widow is teaching us, or this parable. We lose heart when we don't see what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. And that is contrary to what God is teaching us here. We lose heart when things don't come out the way that we expect them. And we lose heart when we lose faith in the promises of God. The difference between assurance and losing heart. How assured are you that God is for you and not against you? When you have a sense that God is ignoring you, you lose heart. When you have a sense that God doesn't care for you, you lose heart. When you have a sense that God just doesn't want to listen to you, you lose heart. The parable that Jesus is teaching his disciples is that we ought to pray always and never lose heart. Never faint. Never give up. Never, ever give up. Because God has a way. God does it his way. And we can trust God to care for us whether we're praying for our grandchildren or we're praying for our children or we're praying for a stranger, we need to know and be assured that the promises of God are real and that God is for us and not against us. And so the question that I ask myself and that I want you to consider is that if God is faithful, are you? If God is faithful, how faithful are you? You see, the question is, when Jesus comes, will he find you faithful? When Jesus comes at the end of time, will he find faith on this earth? Will he find you in prayer? Will he find you on your knees asking God? Will he find you in service? Will he find you as his disciple? When the Son of God comes back to earth 
at whatever time. You see, one of the things why we may faint is because Jesus is just taking too long. Doesn't it? It feels that way sometimes. Jesus is taking too long. Lord, what's going to happen in this world? You're just taking too long. Come now, Lord Jesus. You have no idea that Jesus is being so merciful that he doesn't want to close the books yet. You may not be aware that God is giving you every chance, every opportunity, you and others, and he doesn't want to close the books yet. But we think he's too, too slow because we look at things from our perspective and we need to trust God in his perspective. So if the answer to your prayer is a little slow, don't lose heart. Keep insisting. Keep persevering. Because God's promises are true. God's promises are real. And at the end of everything, we have a God that is waiting for us and that will provide everything we will ever need. Ultimate healing, ultimate resolution to all our problems may not be on this earth, but there certainly are in heaven. And we can trust. We can trust in God. But never, ever give up in your prayers. Now, I was thinking this morning, um, actually, you know, I get up early and I pray for my sermon and I pray for you. And, and I just pray for God to do something with us. And one of the things the Lord kind of reminded me uh, today, this morning, was that there are several things that are essential in the Christian life. And actually, there may be more, but I just came up with four things that are essential in our Christian life and essential in our relationship with God. And I'll just give them to you in the order that I believe of importance. One of the things that is essential in our relationship with God is worship. It's worship. The worth that God has in your life. Worship is essential. Worshiping God is not optional. It is essential in our walk. In fact, for those of you that know a little bit about Cursillo or have been to Cursillo, and I hope every one of you will experience it at some point, uh, we speak in Cursillo of a three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool is piety, study, and action. If any of these three legs are taken from the stool, the stool collapses. Right? You understand the analogy? You try and sit on a two-legged stool, and you're going to end up on your head on the floor. In the Christian life, it's the same way. Piety is worship. Worship is that relationship with God where he is my God, and I need to exalt him and lift him up. I live in him, and he lives in me. One of the essential things in the Christian life is that we live to worship God and to worship Him not just by singing. We worship Him in everything we do that gives Him worth and praise and honor. The way we behave, the way we treat each other, the way we do things, because He's our God, we show Him to others. One of the things that is essential in the Christian life, in our relationship with God, is worship. The second thing that is essential is prayer. Is prayer. As important as breathing is, prayer every day and without ceasing. Prayer is essential. It would be unbelievable to think of a Christian man or woman who does not spend time in prayer. Maybe that's why some of our Christian lives are weak. I'll let you consider that. The third thing that I found essential in the Christian walk is study. Is study. We need to learn what God wants, and we need to receive how to apply. We study not to know. We study to apply. 
You can quote scripture all you want. If you're not living the Christian life, I don't know what scripture is doing in you, but it's not having an effect. We are told in James to be quick to hear. Quick to hear. Especially the word of God that gives us birth. Study is essential in the life of all Christians. Worship, prayer, study. And the last one I thought of this morning that I think it's essential is service. You have to practice what you believe. James again tells us the faith without practice is dead faith. It's useless faith. It's warm, fuzzy feelings with no Christian testimony. So to me, these four things are essential for anyone who wants to truly walk with God, in communion with God, hand in hand with God. Worship, prayer, study, and service. And I think this parable today teaches us, teaches us, that in prayer, we need to be persistent, constant, persevering, and not faint. Every day, every way, in the same way until God gives us what we're praying for. And we don't blame him if he doesn't give it to us. We just keep going at it. Because that's what Jesus is teaching his disciples. It is a sign that we trust in God, that we come every day at the same time, in the same way, with the same need. It is that we trust him as the only one that can deliver us from whatever our adversary is doing. So that's the parable that Jesus teaches us. And I hope it blesses you today and that it will renew your desire to be in communion with God in prayer.